Hey everybody, this is Mirbon Aranshad with my good friend Jorge Capistani. Uh, but it's always a pleasure to have Jorge on. If you've been uh, a part of the summit in previous years, you'll definitely know Jorge and uh, just how impressive uh, his resume is, and uh, you know how talented and uh, you know smart he is as a as a tennis coach. So we're here to talk today about the tactics that every player needs, and uh, Jorge has a, a great presentation queued up for you all, and then we're also gonna answer your questions as well. And Jorge is going to also show you around, um, you know, his, his website and, and, and reveal a, a really cool offer that he has as well at the end. So uh, let's, uh, I guess, let's begin by, um, you know, talking about just generally, uh, you know, tactics. What are your views on tactics, Jorge? Like, what, why is it so important to really come in with tactics as opposed to just like being reactionary? Because I remember when I was a younger player, I would not be thinking at all about tactics, to be totally honest with you. I would just reacting, getting every ball back, not thinking at all. Um, so what's what's the importance there? <laughs> yeah, so I've been at this for quite some time. I've taught, you know, literally over 63,000 hours on the court, 40 years. And, you know, I'm passionate. I want to have my players do the best possible. But as a junior, uh, I was fairly not smart. I mean... The way I played tennis is I wanted to play the way I liked. And for me, that was an aggressive baseliner. And that was fine. It probably was the correct way for me to play, given my temperament and my game style. The problem was if I wasn't winning that day, then I was screwed. So I had no no other options. I, I had very narrow, uh, like a toolbox is where you keep all your tactics. And uh, my toolbox, I had basically two tools in there, and that was about it. So uh, if I was winning, great. If I was not winning, um, I was basically on a ship that was sinking. I knew it, the opponent knew it, and I was just um, lost. So tactics, I think, you know, I'm, you'll see when we start the slide presentation. I think that the number one job, I've kind of thought about this forever. This is what I tell people wherever I go on the planet. Uh, the number one job of a tennis player is to acquire more and more usable tactics. Okay, so if Mayorbon has eight things that he can do and actually deploy, uh, and I have three things, that's very likely that you're going to win that match. Um, and if, <clears throat> if I have one and you have ten, that's even more likely. Uh, so I think a lot of people don't look at it. You know, I do a lot of just game planning and, and I say game like someone's entire game and what I like to do the most and what I've had the most success with in the last decade is just sitting with players and helping them understand like, dude, this is your game. Like think about the pros. The pros know what they do well. They know what they, what they need. And they also don't need anything. You know, I, I think back at, you know, when uh, Andre Agassi played, <clears throat> he could do a lot of things, right? He was amazing for the baseline. He was an aggressive baseline or counter puncher. I wouldn't say he was a net rusher. I wouldn't say he was a serve volleyer. He he knew what it was. If someone said, hey, Andre, I need you to serve volley at this point, he could do it. But it wasn't usable. He wasn't about to deploy that in competition when it mattered. Okay, so I think what people do, I do these things called tactics audits. And almost every time when I sit with someone and they're really honest, they realize that, man, I don't, I just do one or two things and that's it. Uh, and the whole point I think of your existence as a tennis player and as a coach is just helping people say, hey, we got to add, man. Bear in mind, you, you can't slice. You can't hit a drop shot. You don't even come in on short balls, and you definitely don't you know, uh, or whatever it could be. That's a problem. And I think what people yeah. screw up a little bit is when they think of adding a tactic, they hear the coach say, hey, I need you to be able to hit drop shots. You know, you've got to have a drop shot in your game. And they go, oh, my gosh, the coach wants me to become a drop shotter. It, no, we're not. We're just adding a tool. We're not switching your game plan. If you're, if Maribond's a steady baseliner and I want to add a drop shot, it doesn't mean that you're now a drop shotter. You're just adding something. And I've had so many people be resistant over the years or more, you know, the number one frustration I know for players is that they play and they, they try to make a technical change or add a drop shot or change your grip on the serve or whatever it might be. And they can't get over the hump. They kind of they get halfway there, then they give up, and they get halfway there, and they give up. So we're going to talk a lot about that and some things that work for my players, and hopefully, um, you know, it'll, it'll be revealing for people. Uh, and then we're going to go on the website because that's where a lot of drills are that I can teach you on, and then that's also my bonus if you buy through us. 
So you'll get a, a, a peek at that so you better understand it. So yeah, that I think tactics are super important. That's what everybody's game is. And some are deployable and some are not. That's a big that's a big area. I think everybody knows what the tactics are. Hey, drop shot. Oh, I can drop shot. It's not if you can drop shot, it's would you drop shot in a meaningful point? That's the better question. And a lot of people say, Well, I can serve volley. I, I never would in real life. I'd be a bad idea, but yeah, I know what it is. So just because they know what it is, they think, well, I know it, but it's not deployable. It's not usable. And that's the big challenge, I think. Yeah, great stuff, Jorge. Uh, and, you know, we had talked and you'd showed me your presentation before. And, and I'm really excited about it because it was already illuminating as I was watching it. <coughs> so I'm really excited to for everybody else to uh, see it, you know, when you reveal it soon. So just a couple of comments here. Alexei, Jorge is a legend. Glad uh -huh. to see both of you. Thank you, Alexei. You're a legend as well. Um, and you're right about Jorge, at least. <laughs> uh, but thank you. Um, Aaron, Jorge, thank you for all of your drills. My high school kids love them. Enjoy yeah. your talk at the Texas Tennis Coaches Conference. I love awesome. it. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome, Aaron. Very cool. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, Sue, hi, Mirabon and Jorge. I'm excited for this talk. I love your drills, Jorge. <laughs> all right. A lot of Jorge fans. Love this. Edward, uh, greetings from Palo Alto, California. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah, and Tom Nordstrom. Hello again, Tom. Uh, you're at all the live streams. I love it. Uh, hi from WPB Florida. One more time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, sure. brains uh, turned to mush already. Um, good stuff, Jorge. So, uh, should we go to your presentation then? Yeah, let's get started there and then we'll jump around a little bit. So, are you able to see my screen now? Maybe I just want to make sure. I'm yeah, going. and if everybody can see it, just say, uh, just confirm it uh on yeah. in the chat but yeah i can it's see good. it okay cool so let's let's kind of get going because the way i like to talk about this is the main job of a tennis player so we, i'm just going to click through here and it's really two jobs uh the first one we talked about um, acquire more and more usable tactics that's the key word there and then job two which we'll get into a little bit is learn some sabotage skills um and that is your ability to make the other person play bad. And that's a big mind shift change. A lot of people don't believe that's necessary because everybody would rather have themselves play good. And that's what they focus on. You know, if they don't play well, they just go, well, dang it. I, you know, I got to play well. Tell me how to play well. And it doesn't ever occur to them to think about the other side of the net uh, and what you could do to make them play worse. Okay, so we'll get into two of those things. So here's a little sample. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I mentioned that. Um, sorry, see, I, I muted myself for that cough. I'm very proud of myself. I usually don't do that. Okay, so this is a real quick um, skill acquisition tactics audit I do. All right, so we got player A and player B. And then look at the middle column. And in the middle column, I'm going to put, let's get over here and do that. These are just some examples, Mirabon. I mean, number one here, some tactics that any player might aspire to be able to do, okay? Um, and hopefully, if I'm coaching someone, I, I, they can do all these things. So one, push the opponent back. That would probably move, include boom balls. Uh, two, use slices when you're playing from the baseline. Uh, change the pace of your shots. Uh, serve and volley. Isolate the weaker side. Use drop shots more. Can you grind out five or more shots and get steady and play that kind of gear? Could you, uh, can you serve relentlessly and ruthlessly to their weaker side so that you decide as the server what they hit, not them? Um, serve plus one, do you even know what that means? Are you serving to a light, the proper location so that the chances of you hitting your best shot on the next shot um, is heightened? Same thing on the return. Can you come in on short balls? Can you attack second serves? And if we wanted to, we could probably just do a, you know, we could come up with 50 of these things, right? These are all things that we might want to do. So here's what I do. Let's say that in this example, Mayor Bond, you are player A. And look at that. Mayor Bond does this audit, and he has a lot of options. And then I am the poor player B on the other side, and I only got about three things I can do. Okay? So this is good. I would look at that player. And by the way, what earns you a green checkbox is important. So my measure, the way I say it to people is, if you would be willing to try something at, when the score is 4-4 in the third set, 
if you have the guts or the cojones, yeah, I'll do that, then you can do a check mark. Um, and if you can, if you would not be comfortable doing it, because otherwise, if you don't use that filter, everybody says, oh, yeah, I know where I can do all these. And you don't want to kind of BS yourself. You want to be honest with yourself. So here's the problem in tennis. So look at that top item right there, right? Push the opponent back and move ball right, right there, that one. Hmm. <clears throat> here's a little problem. And tell me as, if you're watching if this has ever happened to you. So Mayor Bond's player A, he has more things. He's probably thinking, you know, I'm, I'm going to beat this guy. But what if the match unfolds and Mayor Bond gets suckered into doing moon balls with me? Because that's what I do well. I start moon balling. Next thing you know, he's way back behind the line. So all those other things, you know, they just go away. And we're just left with that. You know what that is? Nightmare, baby. <laughs> and probably with, a, with the example of the moon ball, that's probably somewhat, I mean, probably a lot of people here have lived this nightmare. Where you know you're playing some person that you have so many more options and your strokes are better and you're faster and your car is nicer and your volleys are better and your serve is better and somehow some way I got suckered into this stupid moonball rally and here I am and I'm losing this schmuck that I can, you know happens all the time all right so depending on where you are you know if you're player B this is good you don't you really only have to be able to do one thing better to have a chance. Right, so that's the positive side. Look at it that way. If the other guy has a lot of weapons, just find the one thing that you can do better. Uh, the bummer is if you have everything, uh, you have tens more options, and you you know, and you get suckered into the one thing you can't do good. That's going to happen. So let's go through this thing because one of my worries about tennis players is when they come to adding tactics, making technical changes, whatever it might be, uh, they suffer greatly. They screw it up and they end up being maybe some people can think about this i have players at my club at all past clubs they've been trying to fix the same issue for years sally jones wants to hit a, a spin serve she's trying to learn that grip the continental grip and man she's been at it forever and she just can't get it done and the so she takes more and more lessons and so this, this is a huge problem, and I want to show you how I do this. So skill acquisition as it relates to competition, um, I guess this would be my warning. So what are the four modes? Um, I'll list them up here real quick. So number one, I call it learning mode. So this is a skill that's new to you, um, and you want to add it, basically. As And really what is signified in that area is three things. So when, when a player is in learning mode, a new shot, a new skill, whatever. Um, they're not very confident and definitely should not do competition. Okay. As that skill gets better, it might take hours, it might take weeks, depending on the person and the skill. Then they graduate. Now they switch from learning mode to training mode. And here the shot or the skill is gaining confidence. They're not as scared of it. And you can start to ease this towards a match and make it, you know, you can introduce some point play. All right. So it makes sense so far, right? People say, okay, I get it. After training mode, if the skill is improving, then you progress to number three, which is non-official competition mode. Now the skill is ready for match play. Um, non-official match play means not a real match yet. Uh, practice matches is predominantly what I would recommend here. And then assuming the skill is still progressing, it might take an hour in this third stage, it might take three weeks, who knows, then the skill can be uh, deployed. So now we go to official competition, which is the, when the skill is ready for deployment, uh, might be a tournament or league match, and it's on your permanent record. Okay. So when you, when I explain this to people, they go, okay, yeah, I kind of get that. Um, whatever a skill might be, learn a drop shot, whatnot. So look at box one. They, they get that, and here's what happens, and this is what I want to warn you about. They go here, and instead of moving around, what do they do? The next day, they jump into a league match, and they compete. And then guess what happens? Uh, it doesn't go good, okay? And then they run back to the coach. Coach, help me, help me. And, oh, let me fix. Okay, yeah, I'm here, Mary Bond, let me fix you. And the coach fixes them, and then what do they do? They go back, and they compete again, and they just go back and forth in this torturous thing, uh, thinking every time they're over here in competition mode, they don't, it doesn't perform the new skill lets them down, they go back and take another lesson, lets them down, and 
it's murder and they just can't, you know, it's no fun. And then the thing that happens is they just give up on it. Right. So I know that there's some people watching because this happened to me, particularly as a junior when it came to the serve grip. Okay. Um, I was self-taught, so I didn't have a continental grip when I started, but I could get it in. I can even put a little spin on it. And when I started getting official training, the coach said, hey, if you really want to have a good serve, you got to have a continental grip. Literally every pro uses it. It's non-negotiable. I said, okay, I'll try it. And man, I didn't learn it right away. So it was tough. So here's the thing that I would lead you. Again, if you're listening, if you're res resonating with some of these heartaches, uh, you're going to go through four stages as you learn a new skill. It's just the way it is. Uh, you got to know what these stages are before you start. If you don't, you're setting yourself up for trouble. Uh, and if you don't do it, it's way more likely that you're going to give up on whatever it is you're trying to accomplish. So let me share the four stages. And we're going to use an example here. Jorge, when he was trying to use uh, learn a serve grip when I was basically 17 years old. Um, the first one was unconscious incompetence. This is not tennis specific. This is for everything, but I'm applying it to tennis. So unconscious incompetence, basically, and then, then we go to conscious incompetence. Then we would progress to conscious competence. And then ultimately, we want to end up with unconscious competence. So what's what does these mean? Let's just start with one. Unconscious incompetence is when the players, are, they don't even know what they're doing wrong. So that was the day that my coach came to me and said, hey, do you want to learn how to serve like a pro? Sure, coach. Well, do you know what a continental grip is? Nope. Uh, let me show it to you. I, that's where I was. I didn't even know that I was doing it wrong. Okay. Then I went to stage two. Now I know what it is, but I kind of, I'm not good at it. I kind of stink. Right. So that I stayed in that stage for quite a while, but at least I knew. Okay. Someone could look at Jorge and say, okay. He has head knowledge now, but he, he, you know, he still doesn't do it well. Uh, and then if you stay in there, you'll go to stage three. And now the skill is improving, okay, but it's not autopilot. You can probably, <laughs> most shots go through this state, uh, these stages, shots or skills. Uh, and then if you stick through it, uh, you get to stage four where you're proficient at the skill and it's done automatically without thinking, right? So... I went through those four stages when I learned the grip, when I learned the drop shot, when I learned to slice, when I learned to serve and volley. I didn't know any of these things. But the deal is stage one is, oh, it's really, you know, takes seconds. Someone tells you, boom, all right, I'm off to stage two. Now I have head knowledge. Stage two, it depends, right? I could teach Sally a, a grip serve and maybe she gets to, through stage two in a matter of minutes. Um, or I could do another person, Jennifer, and maybe Jennifer stays in stage two for weeks. She just is having a real hard time with it. So the time that you spend in all these areas is really dependent, okay? There's no right amount of time. Obviously, we all want it to go quicker and, and as soon as possible, but it's not the thing. You just need to know. The reason I want to explain this tonight is because I have a feeling that a lot of people, when it comes to their game, would probably admit to like, well, I definitely need to add more things, but I don't want you just to have head knowledge and do it. You need to know what you're going to go through so that you don't give up on the thing. So let's keep going through the slides here. We have this first one, right? But here's, let's talk about this one here because I coined this phrase years ago, um, I really believe in sabotage skills, um, but someone has to be kind of a, a mature thinker to kind of buy in. So let me just show you what I have for you here and see if this works good. Um, I was watching Shelby Rogers at the U.S. Open maybe a year or two ago. Let's see if I can pull this up and it works. Um, okay, so do you see this video right here? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, now the audio on this is a little crappy, so I'm going to play it and I'll, I'll talk. She had just had a big win, an unexpected win, right? And you can see it's at the U.S. Open. Let's just, it's only 20 seconds. Let me see what she says here. She just, I think, beat Ash Barty. So she's saying, I don't normally stay in the point longer than Ash. She was handling my pace really well tonight. She was handling my pace really well tonight. Mm -hmm. The harder I hit the ball, the better she hit. So I tried to throw in some high ones. And so I tried to throw in some high ones. 
That is definitely not the way I'd like to play. But it's what I needed to do tonight. And I'm sorry for the audio being as stinky. But dude, that sounded pretty good. Yeah. That was literally I I, I recorded this. I, I I this is this is happening on TV and I'm freaking like recording it on my phone. I'm so happy and I'm sending it to my players. I go, players, this is what I talk about. It's okay if that's not how you like to play. Here's someone at the pro level that figured it out and said, okay, even though I don't like to play that way, it's what I need to do tonight. And way too many people think, well, sabotage these skills like slicing and boom balling and just, you know, drop shotting. They're not legit skills. Only wussies do that. And it's totally not. So that's why I got this next video. <laughs> Again, I still teach. So I, I uh, bring this over here. This came onto my Facebook page. Uh, last year during Wimbledon, right? And they were showing all these shots, and it dawned on me, like, dang, every one of these. So I'm going to make this big, mm -hmm. and I'm going to mute this. So here is Ash Barty. Just watch this. I'll talk over it. And she's hitting a drop shot, um, which is a sabotage tactic, okay? This, boom, no way she's not going to get it. Uh, here's a uh, drop shot by Angie Kerber. Comes in, lob of the next shot, one-two punch. Everybody, I got people that won't do that because it's it's wussy mm. tennis. And here's the best, you know, Grand Slam champions freaking doing it. Okay, here's another one. Here is an approach out that's short on purpose. You know how many mm. high school boys want to practice that when I tell them, hey, you should add this type of approach out. It's an approach drop. Nope. Why no not? Because <laughs> they, I don't know, they've labeled it not right. Um, but it happens all the time. So here is, she's off the court, Angie. But notice what she did when she was off the court. She threw up a moon ball, right? I have players that are too proud when they're off the court to throw a moon ball. Then she comes up with a passing shot. Okay, here's the next one. He, did you notice this is uh, Alcaron over there? So he hits a loopy-ish ball, kind of high bounder, which then gets a short response and he pounces on it. Mm -hmm. Right? So this stuff happens, but the bummer for me is I think – too many times. Let me get rid of this. Uh, shrink that. And get rid of that. Too many times people look at the pros and they're not noticing. Like, uh, they're not doing that. I don't want to learn that stuff. I want to tell me how I can rip it hard and look good at the same time. And that's how I want to play. And they're really, you know, I don't know how to help people like that. So let's go on over here. So when it comes to learning something, um, I think adding a new skill I'm, again i'm doing drop shot as an example here uh you got to go through three phases you got to learn it assuming the person doesn't know how to do it and then you got to practice it and then you got to deploy it so we'll go through these real quick and then we'll head to the website where you can see a bunch more okay <clears throat> so what i have here <clears throat> this is me teaching someone a drop shot so if you don't have a drop shot by the way here's here's what I, a big takeaway for tonight Literally everybody in the world should have a drop shot in your game. The way tennis has evolved right now is if you play 100 matches, 100 league matches, 100 high school matches, 100 pro matches, I don't care what it is, out of that 100, your opponent 99 times out of 100 is going to prefer to be playing from the baseline. They're going to be a steady baseliner, an aggressive baseliner, a moon ball baseliner, a runner retreat, some – the, the certain volleyer is almost distinct. I'm not saying I'm happy about that. I'm just saying that's reality. So if you play 100 league matches and you already know through logic that, man, 99% of the people I play are going to prefer to be back, it is a crime not to have a drop shot, a usable, deployable drop shot. Um, so here's what I do. I'm going to talk over these. We won't go too far. When it comes to teaching the drop shot, uh, I tried a billion different ways, but here's just some cool, I'll make this big. Uh, I get the continental grip. I'm showing how I find it here. And then I got my wife and another student. I'm just having them do this chop right here. Uh, chop and having it go. Right? Um, this is because what I'm really teaching right here, most people would immediately start teaching the drop shot by hitting drop shots. Uh, I take it a step before that. I'm going to try to get you to just understand what's happening here and how the racket comes across the ball. So then uh, part two here, yeah, I missed it, is now I want the player – to go both sides, backhand side, forehand side, and they're going to do this little chop, slice, rally to themselves. And their body's just learning. 
if you don't know how to do a drop shot, this would be a perfect little way to start to get the feel in your hands for how the ball comes across the strings. Okay. Um, okay. Well, this is learning. My wife and this kid know how to drop shot, but this is how I would teach <clears throat> a drop shot to someone that doesn't. So if you don't know how to drop shot, this is what I would do. Then only after they get that, we start <clears throat> bringing it across the net and we just start doing mini tennis, uh, basically chopping into each other and, and real, from real close up to the net. All right. So that's how I started. All right. So let's get rid of that one. And then how do I practice it? So let's assume now that the person, let me click that again, <clears throat> is they get it, all right? I know how to do it, and now how do I practice this? So here's the practice for the drop shot. You're going to – I'll jump out because I hate just showing videos. All right, so what I've done here, let me just show you some. Um, you see the course lit up here, right? Let me make that a little bigger. <clears throat> Boink. The front half of the service box is zone one. The second half is zone two. So Marty, my wife, is hitting that way and watch. She's keeping track. Okay, she's trying. She's got a target, right? So she's off a rally. There it went, and there it went. So she got two. The goal is to let the first ball bounce into here and the second ball bounce into there, right? And I'm just letting her try. And it's going to be stinky. And now it's Brendan's turn. So Brendan is now... He's got to wait and see when to try it. He's got to receive a short ball. When is he going to do it? Not there. Okay, when's he going to do it? Okay, not there. He's waiting. He's Oh, I bet it comes. So here's his drop. Boink. All right, so he does not get a point because his first ball landed in the second area. All right, so going back and forth. Perfect drill to take it to the next level and practice your drop shot. Okay, then once you've learned it, once you practice it, now you deploy it. Okay, so what does that look like? Uh, let's open up this screen um, and make this big and go here. So now what's going to happen when it comes to the point, I want it to be that much closer to a match. Okay, so they're going to be playing out points. Um, and both of them could try it at any time they want. And I'm just going to be judging. So basically it's point play with the goal of trying to hit a drop shot and getting your points. So you'll notice when someone tries a drop shot, the other guy isn't trying to get it. You know, you're just trying to see if it bounces twice. So what happens in this drill is if Marty is trying it all the dumb times when she's way back behind the line or what's coming too hard or if it's way out of her strike zone, then that's when my coaching comes in, all right? So now watch a little bit more. They're going to rally. Either player can try the drop shot. Okay, but they start like a real life point. They're both looking for opportunities to drop because they want to deploy it. And the assumption here is that it would work against your opponent. And there that point didn't. So then now they rally. Here comes Marty. She's going to try it. Doink, doink. Marty, my wife, is a rock star. Okay, so she, she does it pretty good. So there's three little drills that you can go through just to learn that one single thing. All right. So now I know that we're going to talk strategy. So I'm going to, I'm going to do the big thing now and I'm going to probably stop that and bring this over here. Corey, okay. quick question for you, if you don't mind, like, sure. I guess at what point do we know that we're sufficiently proficient, like saying that game, like when, how many do you think we would need to make uh, if, if that's yeah. the correct way of thinking about it, you know, before we can deploy? Yeah, I like that. I'll, I'll answer it two ways. So the first level of saying is deployable is, is your gut. Like, okay, I can try this. I can, you know, you're mm. confident enough to try it. Um, but what if you try it and you're over 20, you were confident just that when I did it, and I, I was over 20, then it's not ready. So there's two things you got to do. The first is you personally got to feel like, okay, I think I, I can unveil this and deploy it in, in match play. Um, and then you try it in match play and then you got to see what happens. If you're making 50% of them, Hey, that, that's not, I would keep doing it. If you're losing 70 times or 70% of those points, then you say, okay, I thought I was ready. I was ready basically confidence-wise. I'm not ready efficiency-wise, so then you back off. So it's really a two-part answer. Um, what I find is a lot of people, they, the shot might be ready. I think it's ready, but they're mental. Like, I can't do it. I can't do it. And mm -hmm. so they never even deploy it. And I'm like, man, you have a – I think you have a deployable drop shot. And you just freaking won't deploy it. Why don't you just do it and get the feedback? And then they deploy it, and sometimes like, oh, gosh, I did five drop shots and won four points. Dude, that, that's it. That works. 
Um, okay, so um, that's a good question. All right, so guys, on the website here, the, I want to show you a bunch of stuff here. This is my drills website. You saw earlier a lot of the comments saying that people like my drills. So I'm going to do a super quick tour just so you know what the heck is in here. But this is also, I want to do two things. I want to teach you some more strategy on how to beat certain styles of players. And then I want to show you um, everything on here because if you decide that you want to buy through my link, this will be your bonus, a year's access to this website. So it's really started here with, with drills, right? So if you're a coach, you'll love this. But if you're a player, probably not so much because this is group drills. There's 277 drills just in the singles category. There's 2,000 overall. And you can watch them all high def. Every one is a printable diagram. So if you wanted to print one and take it out of the court, do what you can. So that's that. This and this are going to be huge. So I'm going to start here, and I'm going to show you. Because if, as a player, this is where you're going to want to spend your time. So I have this whole strategy book. Um, I've sold literally 20,000 copies of the thing. It's very popular. It's meant to be with you on the court because we can't get coaching. And when it comes to singles, we have how to beat the moon ball or the steady baseline or the runner pusher, the aggressive baseline, the sort of, all these different styles that you might encounter and how to beat them. Okay, so let's just click on one of these, the steady baseline. Okay, so when you click on it, it opens up that library. And the book, this is basically a video version of my book. So um, how to beat the steady baseliner, I always give six to seven tactics that would work against that style of play. And the cool part is you can see tactic one, increase your shot tolerance. You see it right there. Well, the video is me teaching a player to increase his shot tolerance. Okay. And um, I won't show you a lot of it because I think it's boring to watch, but this is something that you would get. But the bigger point I want to make, this is just me talking to my players, is that every style of player that you play, there's things that work. They, you know, we didn't really have to invent them. They've been out there for life. Uh, all I've done is identify them. Another thing that might work against the steady baseliner is for you to get to the net more often. Okay, so, well, Coach Jorge, I don't like to go to the net. Okay, well, then that's not a deployable tactic for you. But it does work. Um, and that, that video would be me teaching them. Another thing is you should use more drop shots because what do we, where does the steady baseline I want to play? From the baseline. So if you have a usable drop shot, that's going to wreck them. And this is me teaching the drop shot. Um, serve and volley more because they don't want – where's the steady baseliner? Where do you guys think a steady baseliner wants me to be? At the net or at the baseline? They want me to be at the baseline nine times out of ten. A steady baseliner – a counter puncher might want me at the net because they like casting shots. But a steady baseline is like, dude, let's stay back and rally, and I would like to out-rally you, and this is how I want the match to unfold. Uh, and maybe I want that, but maybe I don't. Um, so serve and volley and defeats that. Right now I'm not stuck at the baseline. But what if I serve and volley horribly? Okay, that's another tactic you don't have in your arsenal. But everything you don't have in your arsenal is potential stuff to be adding over the next year or so. Uh, attack their weak second serve, okay? Not always, but sometimes the steady baseliners, they don't play with a lot of power. They don't have, you know, you don't think of a steady baseliner and equate, oh, he's got a huge serve usually. Those two don't go together. They might. But if you can attack their weak second serve, that's a great thing to do. Well, how do I do that? Well, there's multiple ways. You can attack it with power, with top spin. You can attack it by treating as an approach shot. You can attack it by hitting a drop shot off it and, and dis disrupt him. Um, tactic six, mix up your pace for the baseline. Well, how do I do that? How do I go from hitting an eight on the power scale to a four, then an eight, then an eight, then a four to kind of be like a, a disruptive ball machine to that guy? Um, and then move them back more. How do I do that? And this drill teaches you. So partly what I want you to do, if you don't even watch the videos, I think the videos would be super helpful. I don't want to spend time watching them here. But let's just go to strategy singles and go to another one the big server okay um yeah i played one of these guys last week he was bombing a server i couldn't we couldn't break him all right take two assists fast shorten your backswing get to your feet moving uh return from different positions chip the return so you see it, all these ideas you don't here's the good news guys you don't have to have all of these but you shouldn't have zero you know if you look at these say 
move in on the Y, that means you're moving forward and split stepping and kind of after you split step, you keep moving forward. That's what that means. If you can't do that, okay, but chip the return. Well, I can't do that either. I'm not good at chipping things and slicing. I'd rather not. Okay, return from different positions. Oof, I don't like to move way in on that. It's, okay, keep your feet moving. And, you know, if you say no to everything, then it, there comes a point where, okay, well, then you're not supposed to win this match, dude. You know, <laughs> what can I tell you? You don't, you don't want to do any of the nine things that typically work. <laughs> it doesn't make you a bad person, but you're probably going to lose today. Um, yeah. So that's that. And then for doubles, there's all these different types of things. It's, it works the same way. Teams that poach a lot, teams that stay, that rush and crush, that means they come in on everything, including returns. One up, one back, super common. Um, I'll just click one to see how the layout is. It's exactly the same. You go here. There's a video. Get to the net. Hit close to close, hit deep to deep, be active at the net, lobby returns. These are all classic things that typically work and the lessons that go with them. So that's the strategy section. And I think, you know, for the takeaway, if you're, if you're never going to go on this site, I still want you to take away the fact that every style of player is vulnerable to certain things. Usually five or six things work well against the steady baseliner, against the drop shot lobber, against the aggressive baseliner. So... Um, you got to know what they are, and secondly, you got to start getting to the point where you can actually do some of these things and not just have head knowledge. So now I want to spend some time here because if you do end up getting this, um, I think there's places in the lab. So think, think of the lab as courses, and they're no longer drills. Um, so I'm going to click here. I think technique would be interesting. Masterminds would be interesting, uh, but really courses. Once you click, so imagine you have access to this for a year. You're going to go through here. There's going to be a ton of courses, right? Feeding course. Well, if you don't teach tennis, you probably don't need a feeding course. Um, here's Monsters in the Mind with Ken DeHart. He's a master pro. This is the mental toughness talk. It's very, very good. Um, you'll have access. You click on that drill or you click on that button, and it opens up the course. And then there's, there's the course. You watch, and he talks and teaches, and then, you know, it's all – Kind of like that. Um, and again, we're just in courses right now. Um, teaching tennis IQ, I think, would be huge. A lot of people would be interested in that. Um, if you have kids and you want to teach your kids, this would be amazing. Dr. Mark, I think, was on, you know, I'm really good friends with Coach Mark. Uh, he's on here a lot. Warm-up drills, tennis with Mark, um, tennis movement, agility drills, medicine ball drills. So all these things would be courses that you have access to. Um, mental toughness mini course, huge. Again, you come in here, you go into the course, you'll have, you know, a whole year to devour it. Fear of losing, closing out matches, your inner voice, choking, all this stuff is available. Um, back to the lab and courses. Uh, there's just a ton of stuff in there that I don't want to talk too much. I just want people to know what the heck it is. And then I want to open up to questions because I know we've been going for about 40 minutes already. Um, so this is a huge area, uh, and there's certain things in here that are going to be very, very important. This whole thing on strategy and singles and doubles is very good. Uh, the job descriptions for doubles is very good. So ways to create pressure is really good. And this is the one I think I would almost recommend, overcoming pre-match nerves. Man, if I had a nickel for every one of my players that struggled with pre-match nerves, uh, I would be rich because that's a common thing. And by the way, I, that was me in the juniors. I was totally paralyzed. I was totally incapable of assuming the other guy was nervous. I just thought only I'm nervous, and he's cool as a you know. So here's all this different. Oh, these are all video lessons on dealing with that to that topic. The other area I would point out would be this masterminds. Because these are basically, it's a little bit like what you do, Mirabon. They're me talking with experts on stuff. So they're interviews. Okay, here's me and Mark. We did a webinar during COVID. It was all about, you know, the mental toughness. And, you know, you can jump around and go right to those links. So those are kind of the areas that I think would be super helpful. So if I kind of, let me kind of uh, close that out. And I think I can probably even stop sharing. Um, part of what I wanted to do, so... If I summarize all that I covered, um, my passion is trying to get players to understand and to help them get more and more usable tactics. 
if you've been at the three O level for multiple years or the th whatever level, the three five level for years, and you aspire to go high, and it's just not happening for you. You, you're training like crazy. You go to multiple group lessons a week. You take your private lesson. It's just like, what the heck? It's time to put the pause button and say, what am I doing? What's my training regimen? Am I even taking responsibility for my game? And Am I honest? Do I need to add certain things to my game? Chances are, if you're really being honest, those of us that have plateaued, need, we need to add some more stuff. And a lot of people don't do it. Or they do it, and they fall victim to what I described in the PowerPoint. Like, I didn't know these phases, so I tried it, then I went and competed. You know, it's really rampant. I mean, like, serious. Like, 70% of rec players have this issue where they just kind of wish, you know, why is it I always freaking play better in, in practice? And then when a match comes, I, I can't. So it's not just improving a shot. In my opinion, I think you're racing to the wrong finish line. If that's how you're going to solve it, well, I just got to get a better forehand. That's my problem. I think that's probably the wrong target. You're racing to the wrong finish line. You're going to get there. I got a great forehand. I'm not really winning that much more. So I think it's the, you got to race to the other friend, other line, which is you got to do a little audit and be honest with yourself. Can you drop shot? Can you slice? Can you serve volley? Can you be disruptive? And that's when I, when I really get people being honest and they kind of go, nah, to be honest, I don't do hardly any of that. Now we got something. We can go about acquiring, you know, more skills. So that's, that's my BS, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I love it. Um, appreciate it, Hori. And yeah, that that you know um, list of like different skills um, is uh, it, it's crucial. You know, you add one more skill, and maybe that's the skill uh, or, or tactic that you can employ uh, during a match or deploy, uh, whereas the other person you know can't match that, and all of a sudden you can win the match. And yeah, so. Uh, Jay Look says you can plateau from not having enough good tactics. Exactly right. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, the most dangerous is unconscious incompetence. That is true. <laughs> um, uh, Donald Jorge is right. Hard to do a look in the mirror inventory to determine your strengths and weaknesses, and then add to your tennis repertoire rather than manufacture workarounds during a match. Yeah. By the yeah. way, I, I would want to say. I was not like a genius at this. It wasn't like I figured this out when I was competing a lot. I learned this as a coach by having tons of players. I mean, I had really good luck as a coach. I had three different kids that won national championships. So, I mean, these are gold ball winners. So it's, I, I knew I could coach high performance kids, but I still had tons of kids, the majority that weren't reaching their potential and they couldn't figure it out. And I love these kids. They worked like hard, like so hard. They were loyal. They supported me and my family. They came to our club and I wanted the best for them. And I was desperate to like, how can I help Sally make varsity? Uh, that, that's her Wimbledon. She's not trying to win a gold ball. She's trying to make varsity. And, but she keeps choking her challenge matches. And, you know, this is what I've come up with. I, I spent so many years trying to fix my own strokes, thinking if I have prettier strokes and better strokes, uh, that's the key to being good. Well, if that's the case, the, how many times does the person with a better looking strokes lose in our sport? Uh, a ton of a times. Lot. Right? <laughs> um, so it's not that. I mean, I don't want people to have crappy looking strokes, and I would hope that someone would, you know, have great looking strokes and they're reliable. But that's not the right target, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, 100%. 100%. Uh, some more comments here. Tracy, I love your on-court uh, tennis strategy handbook. I passed it out to the kids in my junior camps last summer. Big hit! Exclamation! Thank awesome. You. That it uh, was, it's really clever little book. It's it's uh, you can get it at strategybooklet.com, but it's uh, it's a let's see if I have one here. It's uh, it's a little book. Peter gives them out. I send some to Pete Freeman all the time. He gives them out. But oh, cool! I learned that you know. I coach USTA. I don't coach college. I work at a college. But I don't coach college. So all the people that I would watch forever at my tournaments were either high school players, which I couldn't coach because I'm not the high school coach. They were tournament players. Can't coach during a tournament. Or they were tons and tons of adult league players, and you can't coach during a match. So I came up with these little things where I would give them notes, you know, like, <clears throat> hey, Mary, Bang, you're playing Sally, and she's an aggressive baseline. So try these three things, right? Well, I, it dawned on me after a decade that I was writing that every time 
and say, oh, there's an aggressive base. I'm always writing the same thing. So I just put it all together into a book that now you can have on the court with you. So if things are going great, I tell you, don't bring the book out. Just leave it in the bag. But if you're losing and you can't figure it out, you take it out and you look through those like aggressive moon baller, baseliner, steady baseliner. And you go, oh, page 16, steady baseliner. And you look and you might get an idea or two. It's basically what I showed you on the website, uh, but in book form. And I've, I've had luck where people kind of, oh, uh, I should try to move. Okay, I'm going to try. It didn't occur to me. Right. So it's kind of like jump starts their brain thinking a little bit because during competition, we often don't think so good. You know, we're kind of like uh, after the match. I mean, I can tell you like crazy after the match. I should have done this. I should have done that. Why don't you do it? Uh, I don't know. You know, so we get fog of war when we're competing sometimes. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent with that. Um, let's see. Uh, did I read this yet? Oh no, not yet. Um, Alan Adams of Tennis right. School. I know. Hi, that. Jorge. Oh, awesome, awesome. Uh, great to be back in the game with you guys. Uh, you too. You differentiate between strategy and tactics. Example: strategy. I'm playing offensive today. Tactics: serve and volley, chip and charge, etc. Yeah, great, great question. And yes, I do. So a strategy would be: I'm playing Mirabon. And my strategy today is to get to the net, okay? Now, to do that, I might use chip and charge tactics. I might do serve and volley. I might loop the ball, which generates more short balls and come in on that. Those are the tactics. Uh, another strategy might be I'm going to play for the baseline today, um, and that's my overall strategy. I'm going to be a baseliner. Uh, and then from the baseline, I can be a steady baseliner, a heavy top spinner. I can be a lobber. I can be a pusher. I can be a slicer. I can be a drop lob, you know, whatever. So I do think that the strategy is the overall plan, and then the tactics are your little soldiers to go pull it off. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, great question. Steven, where should you move after your drop shot? Great question. I think um, it's commonly accepted that if I execute a drop shot, I should be moving somewhat forward, maybe not rushing the net per se, but I don't want to stay behind the baseline because – if they do get to my drop shot, the classic response would be another drop shot. So you almost, if you hit a drop shot, let's assume it's a good one and the pulls the guy all the way in, um, you're going to want to be halfway up into no man's land because if they hit a drop shot on you, if they drop shot your drop shot, uh, then you, you, you don't want to get burned. And by the way, that's a great play because if it's short, a drop shot, if I send a drop shot to Mirabon, by definition, it's landing short. And one of the things you need to – Deliver drop shot is that Atlanta short, so it's very likely um, that it's going to be a, a drop shot back. So my best tip for Steven is when you hit a drop shot. Now, if you stink up the drop shot, I have this a lot of players learning it, and they hit a drop shot, but it lands in the service line, and the opponent comes in, and they're not struggling. As a matter of fact, they wound up, and they're going to smack <laughs> it on your throat. Then you don't go. Okay, but if you yeah. see that they're struggling, they're you know their the rack is below net level. I'd be looking for that drop shot for sure. Yeah, it's a great question, and it's good to illuminate that because I remember, you know, when I used to drop shot, I wouldn't like move up, and then I would get drop shotted back and lose the point. But nowadays, uh, and I see this even with like four, five, five, oh, some five oh players, but uh, nowadays, like when I drop shot, I'm moving up, and then I'm I'm usually able to get the reply drop shot. So um, yeah. yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, definitely. That's um, a great question. Yeah, for sure. Let's see, Aaron. Hey, again. Um, wondering how it would go for motivation to create a visible tactics board with my high school kids. Um, what does that say? Uh, names uh, so that they can see what tactics they have and how they compare to their teammates. That's interesting. Huh, yeah. What do you so think about I, that? I've actually done something similar. Okay, so I'll run some camps and we'll do this. So um, it depends a little bit on the student, right? So I wouldn't. You know, if it's a team, one thing you could do is put all the tactics, you know, list them. You know, you can take the 16 I listed or come up with your own. Uh, and then have every, you know, like on a big chalkboard, you list them. And then have every player come up and put an initial next to the ones they can do. Okay, it's a really interesting talk because then you can say, oh, geez, uh, you know, Jorge, I see you, you put down your initials by drop shot. Um, so you think you can drop shot? Oh, yeah, I can drop shot. Well, you haven't had a drop shot in 17 years, you know, so it's a good eye opener. The only problem potentially, because, you know, the, the world we live in, 
Um, if that somehow becomes embarrassing, like I went up there and I only had one and now the whole my whole team people have one and now I feel stupid. So another way to do it is just to do it, you know, you give them a sheet of paper with the tactics and they all do it on their own on their own sheet of paper. And I may not necessarily share it with everybody and I have them turn it in. Um, and another thing I've done, which is even more crazy, is we've done a, a drop shot audit where I had the partners, doubles partners, audit each other. So I'm going to look at these 16 drop shots, and I'm not going to put down if I can do them. I'm going to put down if I think my partner, Mirabine, can do it. Can he lob the return to serve? And I rate, I, I say Mirabine, yes or no. Can he, um, you know, hit drop volleys? You know, can he hit short angle volleys? Can he uh, hit a drop shot off a weak return? And whatever these things might be, um, and sometimes that's more accurate than when the person does it themselves. And the coach is probably, given his experience, might have the, the best accuracy. Like I know what my kids will do and they won't. And quite often when we do these tactics on it, um, more often than not, people say they can do stuff that they really can't. Uh, it's not the other way around. It's not like they're underrating themselves. They kind of overrate themselves. Um, I had this one little gal. She's like this, you know, really pretty good little player. This happened like a decade ago. And when she was 12 and just teeny, and we were doing a tag, and she put serve volley, and she said, yes. Like, yeah, I can serve volley with a usable tag. I go, literally never would come to the net ever. Uh, unless she was shaking hands. She would hit it. If you could hit the world's best draft shot, she would hit it and then run a mile back. <laughs> so I'm like, wow, you really thought that she, because she was mixing up knowing what it is versus I, yeah. can, yeah. she knew what it was. So she thought, oh, oh yeah, draft shot or serve volley. I can do that. And she would. I mean, if I say, you got to serve volley or I'm going to kill your dog right now, she would serve volley. <laughs> It's not going to be, she's not going to really do it when it's 4 4 in the third set. So it's not usable. That was a rough one. Sorry, I couldn't resist that pun. Um, good stuff. Let's see. Uh, Tracy, it makes you actually think about what kind of a player your opponent is and then things to avoid and things to try. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. So, Tracy, I want to elaborate on that because I sell this course on my other website that's called Tennis IQ. And this is exactly what I talk about. So I'm going to define for you three levels of tennis IQ. The first level is for newer players, if I'm teaching a new player. And it's just like how, me and the ball, the player and the ball. It's just all how do I receive this thing? And that's all they're really thinking about. That's all I want them to think about. It's very technical. Then play, tennis IQ level two, a lot of people are here, which is their, all their decision is based on their side of the net. Am I moving back? Am I getting an easy ball? Am I getting a short ball? Am I getting a high ball? Am I getting a fast ball? It's all, and, and they are, I want them to know that. I want them to be aware of what they're receiving and things. I want them to know that, hey, when you're three feet inside the baseline, that might call for a different shot than seven feet behind the baseline. Okay, so that's level two when you're making proper decisions about your own side of the net. And level three, I don't think many people get to, which is your often thinking and strategizing based on the other side of the net. So that means I'm playing Mirabon instead of worrying about, you know, if I'm hitting a pretty forehand or if I'm hitting it hard, I'm now thinking about the other side of the court. I'm like, okay, he, he doesn't like a backhand above his shoulders. Uh, so maybe I should send some of that stuff. And very few people do that. They play ball machine tennis, which is like, I'm, I measure my, my, if I'm playing well, quote unquote, based on if I hit it hard and it went in, like, you know, that's a good shot. But the definition of, you know, the way you determine whether a shot is good or bad is totally misunderstood. Most players, I did this horribly. I only measured if I hit the hell out of it and went in, that was a good shot. Uh, and what I should have been measuring is the only thing you should measure, write this down is the effect it had on the opponent. Did my opponent like it? Did my opponent like it? So I, this is me as a junior. I would hit aggressive baseline shots, and everybody that played against me played well because guess what they like? Hard baseline shots, too. They, you know, they didn't want the ball machine set with these little loopy poop balls. 
Uh, and I wasn't that. I was just, I was like the ball, inadvertent ball machine that I was just sending them perfect shots that landed fairly deep, fairly hard, and right in their strike zone. Um, and I was just measuring the wrong thing. It didn't occur to me that, man. So this that's how I kind of describe tennis IQ. I try to, you know, by the way, I think it happens. Like if I always think of Rafa, Rafa for years to this day, he hits this really loopy forehand to Federer's backhand, especially on clay, right? He knows I don't want Federer hitting a one hand or chest high. If I can get Federer hitting it above the shoulder, he's Federer. He's not going to miss it but it's going to come back way weaker than if I don't do it. And for years, Fed would back up and he would deal with it. And it was a, a problem, but literally before the match began, you knew, okay, this is what's going to happen. And it would happen. Um, so that's proof that Ra Rafa was thinking, you know, it's not that I want to hit the Purdy shot. I got to try to do what's disruptive. I think it happens at the pro level, but the pros are so good that when they receive disruptive shots, they don't shank it like you and I might. So the human eye doesn't see it until you point it out. Wow, look at how many times Rafa hit this higher ball that went to Fed's strike zone four on the backhand. And then you start thinking, wow, that I did notice that. Now that you pointed it out, that's like happens a lot. But um, yeah, that that I love that comment about your opponent. You know, the most important person on the court is your opponent. Uh, it's not us, I, I don't think. Yeah, great insight there. Um, great question as well. Jay, look, uh, what about uh, driving drop shots that penetrate? Is there any utility in those? I'm not sure I understand that. I think what he's – so the way I describe a drop shot, it's all in the Slice family, right? So Slice has three people, three things that live in the Slice house. When I slice, Slice means deep. It's all about where it lands. So when I slice a ball and I use the phrase slice, it's an underspin shot that lands deep. When I use the phrase chip, it's an underspin shot that lands midcourt, like, like I chip it when I come in. And when I use drop, it's an underspin shot that lands really close to the net. So one of the things, you know, I, I think a really good approach shot is an approach shot that is got slice, but it doesn't go all the way to the baseline. Not necessarily a drop shot, but just like the second bounce is like a no man's land. Because now the opponent has to get ready and then also move forward. Now, if it sits up, you know, I slice it and it goes way up and the guy runs up and he has an hour to hit it, that's not good. But um, I, I'm not sure I'm answering that right, but that's how I look at it. All, all underspin family but it can be a slice, a chip, or a drop inside that family. Gotcha. Gotcha. Great stuff. Let's see. What do we got? Oh, I missed one. Oh, hello from Iceland. Excellent presentation. We're learning and enjoying a lot. Greatly appreciate it. All the best. Uh, pretty Not awesome. Iceland. Great to see that. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, sorry. I uh, saw that one already. That one's good. Uh, this is a good question, and I, I feel like this – could apply i wonder if personality plays a part in playing style you know for me it's interesting i'm usually a pretty uh <laughs> cautious individual and you know i was pretty much like uh you know just a baseliner trying to you know get every ball back so i wonder if that plays a part i mean what do you think about that question jorge it totally does i have this perfect story so i w one of the things i work on if i when i have my private lesson students is i would try to come up with quote unquote the vision how should this kid be playing? What's the best way for them to be playing? Um, even if I had a 10-year-old, I was trying to figure it out. Like, uh, I met Luke Jensen. He's a good friend of mine, right? So I, he came and trained at our academy. And when he showed up, he was uh, 13 years old, and he has size 13 shoe. Okay? <laughs> so, and if you know Luke, he's a big dude, right? Um, guy won the French Open doubles championship with his brother. So it was pretty clear that physically he probably wasn't going to be a little baseline or counter puncher. He was going to be a big attacking, you know, finish the point early guy. So I think you look at two things to determine uh, playing style. First is physicality. Are you John Isner and you're nine feet tall? Okay. Or are you someone that's five foot one? That So physicality does put it. But the second one is what she's saying is temperament, right? So some people are just not patient. They're feisty and they, you know, like for me, I would have never been a, 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 
a decent tennis player if I would have been forced to be a steady baseliner. I was an attacking player, and if I hit five shots, I was already bored. I couldn't deal with it. I wanted to end it quickly. That was my temperament, okay? And the example I wanted to give you is I coached these two kids, Linda and Tony Tran. Uh, their parents immigrated from Vietnam. I, they were very close. I still close with them. And Linda, um, she's probably five foot four right now. Okay, it was, so she was a, a player. She she won, she was all American and she won the girls' eighteen national doubles title. Okay, um, so she's all American at Indiana. Very good player, but she was five foot four, and you would think she she won a doubles national championship at five foot four. It doesn't you wouldn't think that would be typical, but her temperament was very aggressive. Okay. She wasn't really, you know, about staying back and boomballing you to death. And she had very good front court skills. Conversely, her brother, Tony, Tony was probably six foot three. Now when he was in 18, he was six foot three. And you would think, okay, his physicality wise, he should be attacking. But Tony's temperament was totally laid back. He would not do it. So I learned that Fortunately for me, when they were like 12 or 13 years old, I kind of realized, even though on paper people might think Linda should stay back and Tony should go in, it's actually the opposite. And that was the right alignment. Think of it this way. Um, you got Chrissy Everett, all right? Back in the day, Chrissy Everett won a million Grand Slams. She was a steady base runner. She was geared and someone raised her correctly and gave her the right style. If someone would have forced on her, hey, listen, you need to be attacking and coming in. You're a world-class athlete. And this is the way you got to play. She wouldn't have been as famous. And the other side of that coin is Martina. Average a little. Okay. It, she clearly came in, attacked, and loves to play at the front court. If someone would have grabbed her in her young age and said, no, no, no. You are a great athlete. And you're going to just stay back here and, and grind. And it wouldn't have been a good fit. So temperament definitely uh, should be calculated. I think it's temperament and physicality. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, great stuff there. Uh, Alan, uh, tongue in cheek here, but if the pros really had, uh, have all these tactics in their tool bag, why do they mostly stay back and beat the crap out of the ball? Maybe this is just an era of tennis. We are in, what do you think? Yeah, I think it's a fair question. So here's the deal. Um, I listened to a talk once with Brad Gilbert. He was talking about coaching Agassi. And Agassi, you know, was number one in the world, went all the way down to 43, and then came all the way back to one. Um, and he's a good example. He does not do everything well, right? Like, no one would say, oh, Agassi, Sir Valley, or he, I saw him serve Valley, you know, as a surprise tactic mostly, but it wasn't in his thing, right? Um, so the thing that I'm glad Ellen asked this question because uh, there was a stat right now, you would think, um, Tsitsipas and Novak, when they played in the French Open final a couple of years ago, I had the stats on a, a different slide. Um, you would The takeaway, if you watch that match, is just they were slugging away from the baseline. Right? I mean, just wailing on the ball, top spin, and it's clay. It's hard to put it away. But when you look deeper into the stats, there were 49 drop shots hit in that match. 49 between a 29 for one and 22 for the other or something. And... Uh, so that's it turned out that they were hitting a drop shot one out of every six points. Wow. With no one, no one at the during that match was saying, Man, there's a lot of drop shots being hit, but they were. But I would say to you, Alan, that the game is I think it has changed. I think there we are in a new era, and the variety uh, that people play, even at the pro level, is just narrow and narrow and narrow. It's all aggressive baseline. Uh, once in a while, you'll see someone like Ash Barty that, you know, throws in a lot of slice and they all can have it. What I would argue is that it's not that they don't have it. Like, let's think of, you know, whoever, um, Djokovic, you know, you wouldn't think, well, he slices a lot, but he, he can slice and it's deployable. He just doesn't need to or doesn't want to. Uh, and a lot of these guys, it's a battle of will. Like, I'm going to say back and pound it. You're going to say back and pound it. I'm just going to do it. Um then what I think is still a bit surprising is how many pros at that level, these are touring pros, that are losing and they don't change. That I think is freaky. When I'm, I'm losing, I'm down 6-3 and I'm down 4-1 and I'm not trying sabotage at all, uh, then I, I guess I don't get that. Um, 
seems to me you're on a sinking ship and a, you know there's always a, a tricky thing like when do i change a tactic well what most people do is they wait till the end and they lose and they go okay now i know i should have changed the tactic because i officially lost and I, you know so you don't want to wait so long um and the hard part is that another reason people don't change tactic is because i'm already doing what i favor i i I started with that. I started with my steady baseline game and it didn't work. So now you want me to try something that's not even my best game. Uh, yeah, because it might be your second or third thing, but it might just happen to be disruptive against that guy. That's what you got to ask. It's not whether it's your third best thing. It's like, will this work? So if a kid of mine loses and doesn't try any other tactics, I'm disappointed. But if a player of mine loses and they said, hey, I started out being an aggressive baseline or that didn't work. So I went to the net. Guy had the greatest passing shots ever. So I stayed back and I started drop shotting, bring him in. I, none of it worked. I'm like, dude, I'm proud of you. Look at all the stuff you tried. You you did a legit effort of going out there and trying stuff. And But I was an aggressive baseliner, and it didn't work. So I just kept aggressive baselining myself to death. And the guy played great. And, you know, that that's less impressive to me. Yeah. Yeah, good stuff there. Uh, let's see. John. Would you agree that the aim of a tennis shot is to put the ball over the net in a way that makes it the most difficult for your opponent? It's a great way to look at it. What do you think? Yes, I do agree. That's uh, yeah. uh, that's that's how I measure shots. It's it's not about you. <laughs> um, most people don't do that, John. They they hit shots, and their goal is to feel good about the shot, which to them <laughs> they hit it hard and it went in. Those are the thing. I'm certain of that. And I think at the highest level of that, that tennis IQ, that's what they're thinking. I'm going to do stuff that the other guy doesn't like so much. Now, listen, if you're an aggressive baseliner and you start that way and it's working, then I'm not I'm not suggesting try stuff if you're winning. Just what, If you're winning, do whatever the hell you're doing. That makes sense. Uh, the bummer in our sport is when you're not winning and you don't try anything else. So you just stay on that sinking ship until it goes underwater and then Maybe tomorrow. Um, and that's that's kind of the the bummer, the shame. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, definitely. Let's see. Uh, how many drop how many drop shots per game should be attempted? <clears throat> tips up, and then also tips on disguising better. Yeah, so disguising is really a matter of practice, and you know, you, you can learn that. I think obviously you're going to open your face up when you're going to hit a drop shot, and it's probably going to go like a volley preparation. So if you don't have a slice um, and you hit every backhand like this, and all of a sudden that guy that sees that, then you're kind of giving it away. So I think a good way to disguise a drop shot is to actually have a slice backhand because they see this prep and then they don't know until the end. Now, as far as how many should be attempted, there's a whole bunch of things that go into that. Um, yeah. Does it work against this opponent? Is it even smart against this opponent? I would not be hitting drop shots against Roger Federer. Why? Because Roger Federer at the net is a nightmare for me because he's freaking great up there. So it's a bit opponent base. Also, it's dependent because drop shots should only be attempted when you receive the right shot. So what we send depends on what we, we, we receive. So if I get a screamer off the baseline, that's not a time to drop shot. I should be counterpunching that. Even though I might have made up my mind, hey, Mirabon's killing me from the baseline. I got to get him up to the net, and I have that mindset. I still don't drop shot every single ball. It has to be reasonable, and, and it's got to be somewhat something that lands a little short where I can be maybe on the baseline or just in front of it. So the right things have to be in play. Uh, so that's how I answer it. The drop shots per game depend on you know what how many times you receive something that's droppable, and is it smart against that point? Great stuff. Great stuff. Thanks. And then um, another one from Steven. Difference between chip and slice. Yeah, so I'll explain that again. I call that all the family is under spin shots. Okay. Now, this is Jorge. I'm not saying this is on the internet or in the dictionary anywhere, but the way I describe it, slice means the under spin shot that landed deep, like I'm hitting slice backhand to backhand or something. A chip is something that lands around the service line, middle of the court. So it's not a drop shot. It's not a slice that's in between. And a drop is something that lands really close to the net. Um, so one would look like this. The other one kind of looks like this. And the third one looks like that. 
So they had different parts. But that's my terminology. I don't know if it makes sense. I learned that from my buddy Ken DeHart. Um, uh -huh. and it, it makes sense to me to just call it, you know, one family. The family is under spin shots. And then they're, slip, they're sliced, chip, and drop. Excellent. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense there. I like that system. Um, uh, Olusagun, uh, I learned tennis with ball machine slinger. I have one as well. It's very good. Um, before I started interacting with humans, I would say my strokes are decent, but I observe that I struggle with humans with less decent strokes. Hmm. Yeah, it's a different uh, environment. Yeah, it's totally different. And I, I think starting with a ball machine is not a problem in and of itself. But as a shot evolves, you because that's what's called a closed environment. Uh, tennis is a, a open environment. So open means that there's factors coming in and out that affect the athlete. A closed environment sport, for example, would be swimming, where I'm just me in the water. There's not a, an opponent. There's not changing lanes. You know, golf is the ball still, completely still. That's more of a closed sport. Tennis, the ball comes high, low, fast, low. The opponent's there, now he's there. So what you're describing on the ball machine is a closed event, um, even if you have it going slightly side to side. But then as you open that up, what I would recommend next is ball machine, just maybe just my forehand, and then ball machine where it runs me around. And then I leave the ball machine. I do cooperative sparring with my buddy because now you're receiving things differently, right? The ball machine is probably sending it a certain way, which means I'm receiving the same shot over and over, a whatever it might be, okay? And that's a good way to learn. I think that's a proper way to learn. But as you, tennis is very far from that. So as you go to more realistic to a match-like condition, don't just the next day go and play a match. Uh, then you should spar back and forth with the person. So now you see, whoa, high ball, low ball, short ball, crappy ball, higher ball. Uh, and then if you get good at that, if you stink at that, by the way, go back to the ball machine and then go back to sparring. If sparring goes well, now put some point play. That's that non-official competition. Hey, let's play out some points. Not too much of a scoreboard here. It's not on my permanent record. I don't want to freak out. And if that goes well, then you say, okay, let's let's make this real, a real match where I compete and it's on my record. But um, yeah, that's not on, you know, everybody that says here, I, I struggle with uh, people with, you know, less decent strokes. That's the life of every tennis player, right? We all love to play people that hit fairly hard, fairly deep, and kind of are a great ball machine to us. And sometimes the weaker player are the crappy ball machines. They send back these balls that aren't very nice, and they're weirdly problematic. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Uh, Tracy, are we starting to see a shift back to serve and volley a little more? So I answer that a couple ways. I don't think serve and volley itself is – seeming more present i don't i just don't see it i think going to the net and finishing to the net is becoming more and more uh, i mean there was a period there a decade where it just literally like went away like no one would come to the net um yeah and but so pure serve and volley where the serve you know there's a serve and literally a volley um i still see very very few people doing that but i think craig o'shaughnessy will show you all kinds of stats that say man at every level, high school, pro, college, going to the net makes mathematical sense. You go up there, and more often than not, you're winning more than half the points. Even, But there's something psychological about it. Like what I found is I can explain that to a person, but there's something weird in their brain. They go to the net, they get burned with a passing shot, so they lose one point, right? But the way they lost it somehow feels a little more embarrassing to them. Like, oh, I got burned. They have no problem hitting a backhand in the net and losing one point. But somehow they don't want to go to the net because if I choke an overhead or something. Um, but, yes, I would say that there's more and more evidence. And I think, I don't think it's overwhelmingly obvious, but I think there's more people finishing and making trips to the net. I call them net appearances. Um, I don't, however, feel like there's tons of more people serving a volume. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. Um, not that much lately. Uh, Alan, thanks for that concept disruptive tactics, classic or hey, yeah. yep. <laughs> sabotage, man. I've, I've had so much luck with it. My daughter was a case study for me. She played college tennis and, you know, Austin would get a little nervous on her forehand. So, but she, she had a slice forehand that was very 
confident. And nice. she, so many people hated it uh, that she just, she would beat players that she had no business beating because she would hit that shot, send these crappy balls to them, and they didn't know how to deal with it. Nice. Nice. Yeah, it's different. Um, let's see, John. When rallying slash practicing, we typically try to make it easy for our opponent to keep the rally going, but then we don't get practice in chasing down difficult shots. Thoughts on how to practice? Yeah, I think that I think you should do both. You know, there's there's training and there's point play, right? So training to me is how you're describing it. You know, it's kind of a cooperative hit, and there that should be a form of practice because. You get lots of touches on the ball off a live ball. That's very valuable. But I wouldn't do 100% that because at the end, so the way I might do this is I just saw our college coach doing it. He was having the kids play out points cross court with some targets and trying to hit deep. So that's kind of training, if you will. It's working out. And then he, you know, he did that for a good, you know, 40 minutes, uh, both ways, forehands, backhand. And then he shifted. Okay, now we're keeping score in his full court. And now it's completely different. Uh, now those kids are chasing down the difficult shots and stuff. So I wouldn't do, and it really depends on the need of the person. If I have a, a person who is losing confidence, maybe they come to me and say, Coach Jorge, I'm in a slump, man. I've lost a bunch of matches. I don't feel right. I might keep him in that, <clears throat> that training mode a lot just to kind of help get their groove back and their feel back. And I maybe won't even play out points or have them do the tough chasing down shots for a whole day or two. Uh, but then I'd open that back up and get it closer to a real match. So I think it's art, you know, of, of what what the person needs and how they should train. Yeah. Great thoughts there as usual. Um, all right, let's see. John, uh, sounds like sparring is a solution. Thanks. Um, yeah. And then, Jay, look, I need to learn how to spar. Then my training just taught me to rally on easy balls only. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> um, let's see. Yeah, sparring, uh, let me just clarify something about sparring. Uh, that's the phrase. I don't know if I'm confusing people, but sparring to me is just means hitting back and forth full speed, but without the intention of, of so there's also sparring, I guess, at, at a super cooperative level where you're just trying not to miss and it's maybe even short court. But to me, sparring is full on point play where I'm hitting it towards the guy, uh, but not necessarily softer. So I'm getting, you know, like I might normally hit. But we're on a half a court, and we're just, like, working it out. And by the way, sparring, as I define it, I think pros do that a ton. Look at look at them in the at the pro tournaments and the practice courts. That, that's what's going on. Just tons of sparring. Yeah. All right. Let's see. John, any tips for what makes a good sparring session? Balance between keeping the rally going and making it difficult? Yeah, um, if I'm working with some players, I might tell them, I use the phrase cooperative, semi-cooperative, competitive. I'm always going between those three. Um, so I start out cooperative, which means if I'm rallying with you, Mirabon, on a scale of 10, 10 is the hardest I can hit it. A typical rally ball would be seven, you know, seven or eight if in a real match. I might say, okay, let's just do some light sparring. I want five power level and just keep it going, kind of get your strokes going. And then I might bump the number up. I like to do it by number. Instead of saying harder, no harder, no harder, I give them a scale. So that's a five. Now let me see you bump it up to a seven. Okay, now let me see you bump it up to a nine. Okay, usually a bunch of errors are happening. Okay, let's back it out to eight. All right, let's leave it at eight. So I think um, I think that's how I, I like to describe it by numbers. Yeah, that Power. makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Cool, Ori. Uh, let's see, Kubi. Hello. Uh, how would you split up an hour training session for a four or five player effectively serving first cross court cone work? Yeah, I think if I was had two, five players and two, four or five players, then they're going to actually have a, a workout for, for this called the one-on-one -on -one workout. Um, nice. I would make sure they're doing all five play situations. So during this, you know, hour, you're going to hit surge, you're going to hit returns, you're going to hit passing shots and lobs, and you're going to transition to the net. Um, so those are the, the play situations. I think way too many times people would practice four or fives, especially I can see this happening because we got them on our college team. Uh, and they, their practice session is baseline hitting, baseline sparring exclusively, 
and then maybe at the end they play out some points and then they walk off the court. So no one practice approaches, no one practice returns hardly, no one practice passing shots or lobs. So I would kind of spend time doing both. So I would probably start out with cooperative hitting and then uh, maybe cross court this way, cross court that way. And then I would say, okay, now we're going to play baseline to baseline. I feed it underhand. We're going to play competitive up to 11 points. Okay, now I'm going to feed it short. That's one little drill. The next five minutes, I feed it short. You hit an approach shot. We play it out cross court. We do that for five minutes. Now I come in. Okay, now we're both at the net doing this volley exchange, and then you play out points. So if you did it that way, I think you would walk off the court and say, look, during that hour, I hit some passing shots, some lobs, some you know approach shots, some returns, some serves. I did it all. Um, and I think, frankly, a lot of people don't do that. They do what I describe, which is I, I literally see this every day with our college players at, at Hope. I'm not the coach, but I see them. They're in my building, and they're hitting the hell out of the ball for an hour. And maybe at the end, they'll play out points for the last 10 minutes. Um, or, but it's it's not the most efficient. <laughs> yeah. Good stuff there. Uh, let's see what else we got. Um, oh, and by the way, you know that you're asking about the training session. And I think, as you mentioned, Jorge, you know, you've got so many different resources inside uh, tennisdrills.tv, which you'll, you know, you'll yeah. get, obviously. Um, you can construct your own training plans with all the resources in there. Um, if you get the all access pass and you'll get the, the bonus there. Um, Jorge. <laughs> so let's say Tom, uh, Alcaraz won Miami open final 11 of 11 kick serve and volley ad box as per Craig O'Shaughnessy. Very cool stat. Yep. I like that. And, you know, he, you know, think of a kick serve. Um, it's not the fastest serve a kick serve, but it's just it's disruptive by nature. It's a sabotage serve. The alternative is a serve that's super hard that might be more in the strike zone. But the kick serve, by definition, the goal is to get it up on the guys, usually the backhand side, out of the strike zone where they'll be a little less comfortable. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think that's probably very right. Yeah. Yeah, good stuff from uh, from Craig as usual. Uh, John, any thoughts on how to practice these tough shots without a sparring partner or a ball machine? I just hand feed yourself. I mean, I've seen you know that obviously used as a training tool, but what are your thoughts on that? It's tough. I mean, I I try to come up. If you don't have a ball machine, hand feeding yourself, I think is, in my opinion, marginally beneficial. Uh, I would say that if you don't have a partner or a ball machine, at least try to get a wall because now all of a sudden that can mm. be really helpful. Um, you know, there's an old story. I actually believe it because I heard Mary Pierce, you know, I was presenting in Mexico once at the World Conference right here, and she was a presenter. And she showed this drill that she said helped her immensely, and her dad made it up. And it, it seemed like such a basic thing. And she said, here's what I would have to do for like an hour a day. And she took a ball. And she threw it kind of high in the air. She let it bounce once. She let it bounce a second time. And then she wailed on it. Hmm. And I thought to myself, what the hell is up with that? You know, why, <laughs> would, that, why would that be so helpful? Um, and I don't know. But she swore by that drill she was going to help self-feeding. Obviously, she was, you know, a world-class mm -hmm. athlete. But in her brain, that was a great drill. And I don't know. Maybe because it bounced twice, she had more time to step into it or something. But. Um, it was, I remember that and I, I still haven't figured out what the logic was behind that. Huh. Kind of want to make a parody video of that. I don't know. It's, it's interesting. Interesting. <laughs> uh, I could dress like her too. Uh, let's see. Tom Nordstrom. Hey Tom again. I also do martial arts, Taekwondo and our master has a spar full speed, but no touch with helmets and mouth guards every class or else he says it is just exercise. Nice cross training. That's good. Yeah. Good stuff there. Well, uh, let's see. So I guess, uh, Jorge, if it's cool with you, I just want to um, talk a bit about the All Access Pass just for a bit and, sure. and how it figures with um, Jorge's awesome bonus. It's so cool. So I'll just put that on just real quick. So, I mean, with the All Access Pass, and I'll put Jorge's link in there uh, if you don't see it on the page. But, I mean, you're obviously going to get, um, you know, the lifetime access to all 40-plus uh summit videos and master classes etc 
Um, and then you also get the audio MP3 files, so you can listen to them whenever you like. You know, I love listening to uh, audio, like when I'm in the shower or brushing my teeth or, or just, you know, doing other work. And then you also get the transcripts of all the summit sessions, which is uh, great to be able to just read the information. You can control F and find what you need. And then you'll also get the summit implementation worksheet uh, as well to help you um, curate, you know, the most uh, important points and write them down. You also get exclusive access to our summit Facebook group where we talk about uh, tennis and tips. Um, so that's a lot of fun to interact with everybody uh, who's an all access pass holder. You also get a uh, members only Q and a live stream with myself and a guest coach. And then you'll get a free set of Signum pro or Genesis strings, which is pretty cool. I arranged this uh, with uh, uh, a friend of mine, Richard, who you'll see on Saturday um, to, to get you this deal, which is pretty cool as well. And they make high quality strings, by the way, made in Germany. Um, and then you'll get uh, special deals and discounts from our sponsors as well. And then Jorge has been so kind as to give uh, his access to tennisdrills.tv for one year. And so if you were to go to the website now and you get a subscription, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Jorge, you'd have to pay $200 to get access. And as Jorge showed you, um, <laughs> you know, it's got over 2000 drills, over 80 courses, you know, you've got coaching calls and masterminds. And I mean, the value, if you were to get these things separately is like a ridiculous amount, you know, like tens of thousands probably. Um, but you would, you'll get Jorge's awesome bonus access to tennis drills.tv for a full year. Uh, if you get the all access pass, uh, I don't know. Do you, do we have a limit on that as far as when they need to uh, get it, Jorge? To um, get your bonus. Yeah, anytime. By the time you close down the uh, workshop or the summit, um, yeah. So we can, you know, probably next week when it's all done and, and set, uh, we'll give everybody. I know there's a bunch of people that I already bought through my link, um, so they'll all get it. Obviously, and anybody thinking about it, um, you can see. You know, you saw kind of what's included, and there's. You'll, you'll probably have a year's worth of stuff to get through. There's so many things that might be helpful to you in there. Yeah, and Jorge, I just want to really thank you. I mean, because, uh, <laughs> you know, again, like, you know, if you were to just go to the website, you have to pay 200 bucks, right, for a year. But you will get, you know, for just the $97, you not only get, um, you know, all the bonuses and the summit, of course, lifetime access to all the the, sub, the uh, presentations and uh, master classes, you also get Jorge's bonus. And, and I think, you know, it's just, really valuable to be able to refer to, you know, all these sessions, um, the next, you know, in a year from now, a week from now, a month from now, like you'll remember a tip or you'll try to remember what was said and you can go back to your members area, um, for uh, tennis files here and, uh, and go back to any of them. So, uh, we've had thousands of people take advantage of the all access pass over the years. So, uh, definitely highly recommend it, especially if you want to take advantage of Jorge's, uh, fantastic bonus here, which uh, again, I really appreciate. So definitely uh, a great uh, value. You know, we try to just pack as much value in as we can for you all uh, so that you can benefit from it and improve your game. So yeah, that's, that's pretty much uh, it, Jorge. Um, thank you, buddy. Any other thoughts? Yeah. I just want to say thank you to you. You know, it's obviously a lot of us online coaches are promoting this event. It's actually very easy to promote because people can. Thank you see it free and it's so powerful and you got 40 you know experts basically so good job i know it's an enormous amount of work to put it all together and all the live streams and thanks hopefully uh people got some out of tonight's talk and you know if if you think the tennis drills website would be a good bonus for you then go for it but honestly there's a lot of good bonuses so just find the one from the you know the person promoting that might speak to you the most and and just go and help yourself the most so if it's mine, awesome. If not, you know, good luck to you guys and, you know, have a blast with your tennis. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Jorge. Um, you know, just big kudos to you for just all the great work you do. And, uh, you know, you've really <laughs> got a huge passion for the sport. I mean, otherwise you wouldn't have made, you know, all of these, <laughs> so all the resources you have on tennis TV is like mind blowing, to be honest. Uh, so Sport uh, videos on that is thinking. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot man that's a lot so yeah again um big thanks Jorge, and uh okay. appreciate it, everybody thanks for yeah. joining us thank you yeah, thank you all thank you appreciate it thanks tracy john everybody and uh, we'll see you next time so all the best thank you all right bye-bye